All right, before I get started this morning, I'm going to ask some questions. Now, Mel and Doris, they um, sort of have to memorize the parts, and they've done a pretty good job this week, haven't they? Yes. And, and they're trying to memorize, and we're going to see how good their memories are here in just a minute, because I'm going to ask them some questions. Can, can I get you guys to come back up here a minute? Aren't they a pair? <laughs> Aren't they a pair? The scary part is, if you knew Mel and Doris, this is like way yeah. too close. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Doris, why do we celebrate Easter? Well, we get to dress up and go get candy. <laughs> um, no, that actually is probably another holiday that you're thinking of. Mel, do you know the meaning of this day? It's when we set off fireworks. <laughs> uh, Oh, that's really the 4th of July I think you're talking about. Should I ask anybody else? I know. Easter's when Jesus died. Well, what happened to Jesus that makes this day so special? Well, he died, he got buried, and every Easter, he comes out and he sees his shadow at six more weeks of winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Veterans Day. <laughs> I think you're both wrong again. I think we better listen to your sermon already. I think we should remember this time. I believe I know what I should speak about today. Lord help you both. <laughs> I want to thank you both because you've been a great help to me over these last few weeks. And I will see you again soon. Thank you both. Now the sad part is, we're going to let them get off their knees here in a minute because that's, yeah. <laughs> the sad part is, I'm going to read some scriptures and I want to go into a message simply because most of us here today, I would think almost all of us here today, know this story so well, it becomes second hat. It, it becomes, it's just another <laughs> Easter. And we should never, ever, never, ever. This is the day that we celebrate. This is the day that we take time to catch our breath, to stand back. Now, Friday, I had to take a real deep look at the price that was paid for me on Calvary. I think we even lose sight sometimes of who he was because he was full of so much love and he gave so much and he'd done so much for us. We sort of take it for granted. So I think it's good in different times of the year for us to catch our breath, to step back, and to look. And today, he has risen. Yes. And, and that can't be a churchy thing because, see, I could yell that out in public. And I'll guarantee you, if I'm in a supermarket, if I'm in a mall, if I'm in a bank, somebody's going to answer back, he has risen indeed. That means somebody knows the story, and there's still going to be people standing there that haven't got the vaguest idea what you're talking about. I had men on the job go back years ago. What if I don't believe in Easter? How come, how come we get paid double time to come to work? And how come some of you get a day off? I said, well, if you don't believe in it, give the company back their money. Well, no. <laughs> they want to pay me twice, that's fine. They're going to give me double time, I'm coming to work. And a lot of guys will volunteer for the holidays, and that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read this morning. From John chapter 19, verse 35, all the way down into chapter 20 to verse 7. And I want us just to take a look at a few things, and, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. John 19, verse 35. It says, He that saw it bear record, and his record is true. Now, who else would you believe besides an eyewitness? Listen to these first words. And he that saw it bear the record, and the record is true. we got eyewitness testimony here, folks. We're going to read about how all of this happened. We're going to listen to folks that was actually there. I'm old, but no, I was not there. <laughs> and we know what he says is true, that you might believe. 
For these things were done that the scripture might be full, fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. You'll see that in Psalms chapter 22. Prophetic. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him who they have pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, he sought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore, and he took the body of Jesus. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein this man never laid. There laid they Jesus. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The first day of the week, come Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and see if the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. She said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth with the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, but when he not in. Then come Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre and seized the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but were wrapped together in a place by itself. Now there's the story in a nutshell. Now you see these people begin to interact. And, and I say this all the time, when we read these kind of scriptures, we just sort of read, well, that's another cute little Bible story for our children. These people had lives, they had personalities. When they got up in the morning, their breath stunk. What do you think of that? They had to go down and take a shower. They had, they had lives. They went to work. They had families. They loved their children. Peter must have had a real good mother-in-law because when he got, she got real sick, he prayed for her and she was healed. And we lose sight of all this. Now here's these people that love Jesus so much and, and they didn't have what we have. They didn't know what we know. And all of the promises that Jesus had made, everything that he had said was now done and over with because he was dead, they thought. Isn't it great to know the end of this story? Anybody ever read this book? You ever start reading a book and it gets real exciting in the front and you want to run, jump right to the back, see how it happens? Go ahead with your Bible, it'll work. See, if you read the tail end of the story, church, we win. And not because anything the church or me or anybody else has ever done, but because of him who rose from the dead. And we we got to get a grip on this. We, we walk around sometimes like we're scared to death and we own this place because of him. We need to be a little more vocal about who we are. I'm going to get ready to preach in just a minute. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> so what is Easter all about? It can be all about a whole lot of things to you. It's according to where you are in your walk, and in your life, and your age, and everything else. If you listen to me when I read this, the other disciple was John. And he said the other disciple because he was writing a story. He didn't want to toot his own horn. And he said he outrun uh, Mary and Peter Day. You know why? Because the other two of them was old. He was a young man. Did you notice young men will outrun you? And then he goes. But now look at the difference in the attitudes. Look at the difference of the personalities. He runs down, he sticks his head in, and he looks around. Why? Because there's supposed to be a dead guy in here. And he don't go in. He just sticks his head in and he looks. The old guy shows up and says, get out of my way. I know what he said, but I can't believe what he said because nobody's ever done this before. Get out of my way. And then he goes. Now when he went in, all he saw was grave clothes and a napkin. 
Now, if you read the rest of the story, and you should, when you go home, here's your homework. Read the rest of this. You're going to get a whole lot of good meat in there. There is a whole lot of the Word of God that we need to get a hold of in here. Give you a good picture of things to come. So they ran down here. And I like the fact that John arrives first because it, it just gives you some realism to it. He's half the rage. Understand, when he's writing Revelation, all these people had passed because he was an old man then. He was in it on his own. He was, he was the young kid in the group. And he learned a lot as he grew in his walk with the Lord. But at this point, he's still a little apprehensive. So all he does is peek in. Sometimes you've got to get a few calluses on you, a few wrinkles around them eyeballs. I see them people, they, they get them shots in their face. Anybody ever see those folks? And then they talk like this. Because <laughs> they don't move no more. And if you think you need to do that, go ahead. Every wrinkle I got, every gray hair I got, every pain in my back I got, I have earned every one of these and they are mine. I go in to get my hair cut and the lady says, what can I do for you? I says, make me pretty. And they just grin, they don't even answer. <laughs> because I'm sort of past pretty, what can I tell you? So here we are. Now the Bible takes an entire verse Chapter 20, verse 7. If I get on the right page here. And the napkin that was about his head was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in place by itself. <clears throat> now I'm that, how, what did Rose call me? I'm a Bible nerd. I got called that one day. I'm a Bible nerd. I actually like that book. There's things in there that if you don't get in it and study it and read it, that you'll never know. There's some fantastic things in there that people have done that, that aren't preached a lot, that, that people don't say about a lot, but we still have a responsibility to get our face in the book. Take time to read it. I've been told that the Bible is boring. I'll show you a lady in there that took a traitor gave him warm milk and honey and put him to sleep. And when he went to sleep, she took a tent spike and drove it through his temple because he was a traitor. You think you're going to read novels? Read this book. Oh, there's some stories in here, folks. I got to thinking, how cold is this woman that she fed him, she gave him warm milk and honey and put him to sleep and finished him off. Now, the culture of their time, not to get off subject, the culture of their time, he come running into her tent. Her husband was not home, and that was against their law, that she could not have a man in her tent without her husband present. And so she was subject to ridicule. He was running for his life because he was a traitor, and she found out a way to solve it all. You ladies are smart. <laughs> and I'm not drinking warm milk on any of it. But that folded napkin, I want to go back to culture. Now you're taught in, in, in every culture how we should address people, how should we should talk to people. I want to let you in on a secret. If, if you're in the grocery store and, and there's a little girl, a little boy, and they're throwing herself on the floor and they're screaming and crying, and mom and dad didn't do anything about it, and they're having a fit because they can't get their way, look past that child for just a minute and just think, there is some man or some woman out there going to marry them, and they're going to be stuck with that for the rest of their life. <laughs> Boy, that's not, nah. Nah. They're going to be stuck with that for the rest of their life, because you know what happens when you have spoiled brat kids? You know, spoiled brat adults. And somebody's going to be married to that. And when you see somebody that's got discipline in their lives, it, it doesn't just pop out. Because somebody's taught that to you. Somebody took time out of their life because they loved you. To put you on the right path. To set you in the right way. To give you a set of rules. And you know what to do and what not to do. And you grow up to be a man or a woman. And hopefully you remember your lessons. Like folks that forget all the time. And if you ever raised a child and you ever had to repeat yourself. Don't get excited. Every human being that's ever raised a child has repeated themselves. 
Well, Pastor, you know how many Easter sermons I've heard? I'm repeating myself. <laughs> how many times do you think I've read this? Don't you think that a pastor sits down sometimes and says, Lord, give me a new vision. I need a new way to say this. You know what I usually get from God? You say it the way I wrote it, and you let me do the rest. I just got you for a mouthpiece down there. I will work on their hearts and their minds. I'll do my job. You do yours. So what you're hearing this morning is called the same old story. So now here we are at that neck. Culturally, a young man, and, and fellas, I hate to throw us under the bus. Washing dishes is only mentioned one time in the Bible, and a man's doing it. I'm so sorry. And Jesus told them, when he started talking about washing dishes, he says, as a man washes his dishes, would he just wash the outside of the cup? Would he not wash the inside also? And he's talking about spiritual things. It's good that we all, we're all pretty, the ladies with your hats and your flowers, and I'm serious, I love all this stuff. I'm tickled to death with all of you. But what good does it do if I've got on a $5,000 suit and $1,500 socks if I'm not walking according to what the Lord would have for me to do? Don't mean a thing. <clears throat> Don't mean a thing. Now, back to the napkin. Young men would wait on the tables in, in their homes, and they would go, and they set the tables up, and, and they would taught how to do it, where to put it. Do you guys know which one's your salad fork and which one's your entree fork? I don't. I watch other people. <laughs> you pick up a left one, I pick up a left one. I figure at least if we're wrong, there's two of us wrong. <laughs> I don't know which one goes where. If you're going to go to those restaurants that have all that stuff, they should have like little tags, don't you think? Yeah. You use this for this and this for that. I don't know. A fork's a fork. As long as it gets its food to where it's supposed to go, I'm happy. But now these young men are going to be taught how to do this. Now, uh, during dinner, sometimes somebody may have to get up. Now, at that point in history, most men had beards, the married men. Most of them had beards, and they had pretty good-sized beards, and they let them grow out. And it was part of your status, and they kept them all pretty and neat and everything else. Well, when you stood up, and you took your napkin, not a big napkin, but it's a napkin. You wipe your mouth, and you wipe your beard. Well, if you folded it, and you laid it back, that told the young man that was waiting at the tables, you're coming back, don't touch my plate. Coming back, don't move my stuff, I'll be right back. Now, if they wadded it up and he threw it in the middle of the plate, I mean, I'm done. You clean up, I'm gonna go retire to the next room, prop my feet up, and take it out. And if you read this story in the Gospels, it was very well folded. And it was laid to where it had covered his face. It was laid at the head. Anybody know what nationality Jesus was? Jesus. Do you think that he ever waited on a table? Of course he did. He was a young man, and he was in a household. And he knew full well what that meant. And I just want to say this this morning. The sermon doesn't have to be real long. He folded it up, and he laid it at the head because he was simply telling us, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Dinner's not over yet. I'm coming back. Now, if you want to read a little farther, and I'll jump in this story to help you out a little bit. Mary hangs out, the rest of them beating feet back into town to try to find out what's going on. They got a lot of questions. A guy named Peter did remember what Jesus had said. And see, the problem is, a lot of times we know what the Bible says, but it goes against our hopes and our dreams, so we don't want to hang on to it. <coughs> Nobody in that day wanted to think that Jesus was going to die, to be beaten, to have the flesh pulled from his back. And by his stripes, you are healed. All of this was so prophetic. I mean, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, there's a whole bunch of them. All you got to do is read them. Of what Jesus done for us while he hung on a cross and never said a word, he was accomplishing more than, than anyone will ever do from now through eternity. I think about Golgotha's Hill. 
Hark the herald angels say, glory to the newborn king. When he come into this world, the angels were there. And they stood round about and they told shepherds, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, good will toward men. And we all love that, don't we? And the same angel stood on Golgotha's hill, sword at the red, shield in hand. You say the word, we'll level this hill and we'll set you free. The same angel stood right there. And he said, not time yet. You'll get your time. Our church battle's coming. And we shall win. But until that day. So everything that we look at, and, and we're so happy at Easter, there was a great price paid to get here, folks. And I'm so grateful and thankful to be here. I'm so grateful and thankful to have this story. How would you like to be one of those that's running through here and not knowing what's happening, not knowing what's going on? Peter had enough thought that he remembered in three days. In three days, I'm coming out of here. Death could not hold him. What kind of power is that that speaks to death as if he's a man and he must obey Jesus had done proved himself one week earlier. He sat with two sisters that were just coming apart at the seams. They'd lost their brother. And he looked at a hole and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And in that place of darkness where men go, before that Christ had died, sat a man named Lazarus and he heard his voice. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And it rang in his ears. But every man that had ever gone before him, there they sat and, and nothing could be done. And the voice of him that spoke the world into existence said, Lazarus, come forth. And out he came. Now I think about the difference in one week. Here is a man being called forth by Jesus Christ the righteous. And the way they wrapped them, I don't know how he came out of there. I mean, honestly, you just got called back from dead. How would you come out? <coughs> However I could. <laughs> we, uh, seriously, we want to we wanna try to take all these stories apart and try to figure some stuff out. I was just jumping a minute ago. I don't, maybe he'd come out. Because when he got out, they had to unwrap it. Not the same in this story. What's the difference? The grave clothes were laid in one place and the napkin was folded and laid in another. He came out under his own power. He wasn't waiting for anybody to call him. He is Jesus Christ the righteous. The scripture teaches me that my righteousness is his filthy rags before him. And so what do I have to depend on? I have to depend on his, on the work that he done on Calvary and on the fact that he didn't stay on a cross and he didn't stay in a tomb. But that he is risen indeed. Second Corinthians 5.17 is one of my favorite scriptures. It's one that changed my life. I have many, many scriptures that I think are, are excellent scriptures. I just love them. But this one was one when, when I was struggling, when I was having problems, when I was all for, uh, let's just go back to the old life and forget this. Can't do it. Because I was trying. Listen, let me clarify that. God has never failed me. I was trying. How do you want to put it? To be religious? I was trying to be a Christian. I was trying to, to be something that I couldn't be on my own. Anybody in here, how, how do I want to put this? I won't say stupid or dumb or anything like that. You know, I would never use that kind of thing. Less intelligent to think that you can save yourself. That you can live a good and godly and righteous life. Not going to happen because you'll never be good enough. So what did I do? Sitting down, reading a book that I can't even say at that point in my life I was even real interested in. <coughs> 
I never ran into a scripture that said that I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things had passed away. The whole, all things had become new. You know what that verse done for me? It gave me a backbone. It put a sword in my hand. Now my sword may have been dull. I didn't know a whole lot of the word at that time. In fact, it may have just been a ball bat. But I was willing to go to war with it. I wanted to live for Jesus. I wanted to walk before him. I wanted to believe all this stuff. But I fought it so hard. Fought it so hard. We have people that look at me. Well, Pastor, how old do I have to be before I'm just like you? Number one, don't ever be just like me. I will point you to another guy that you should be just like and do your best to do that. But the idea is I've let the word of God begin to soak in here. I, I'm, I'm serious. I am that Bible nerd. I'm, I'm a spiritual sponge. You walk by and you got something, I'm getting a hold of it. Why? Because I love him that much. And oh, he loved me before I loved him. So Jesus sent Mary out of the garden rejoicing. She sent out to tell the world that uh, the flesh in Jesus Christ has overcome all darkness. How would you say it? Forgetting all the churchy words, and that's hard to do. Forgetting all the Bible stories and everything else. You just realize. You looked in there, and, and listen, when she gets ready to leave, she's talking to the gardener, she thinks, and, and she says, where have you put him? Just tell me where you put him. He's my friend. And I'll go get him. And, and we, will, we will do what is ceremonially uh, uh, acceptable in Judaism. And, and we'll get him all prepared and we'll take him away. But where have you put him? Guess what he had to say? Mary. All he had to say. All he had to do was say, Mary. What happened? When he said Mary. Ooh, Jesus. Mary calm down. <laughs> but Jesus. No, no, listen. I haven't ascended yet. You got to. Just go tell the rest of them that I'm here. Now you can think about this any way you want to think about it. You can believe it, not believe it. Help yourself. You know how many people get out on the road every day and see that sign that says 55 and say, that does not pertain to me. <laughs> and the law is the law, right? And a lot of times we get by with it. I'll be honest, I have gotten by with it way more times than I ever got tickets. Most of my tickets had to do with long hair and a GTO because they do profile you. And they could hear me coming before they could see me. <clears throat> and you think it's funny because when they start getting close, when you go down a gear, it just makes it worse. <laughs> you get that real nice rumble in there, they're going to, yeah. And I, I think about all of those days and everything I've lived through and all the other stuff. And the best part of my life, bar none, is my walk with Jesus Christ. Oh, we got all the other things that we can talk about in our youth and what we were able to do and the things that we've lived through and all of that kind of stuff. The best part of my life is my walk with Jesus Christ. And it shall forever be. So this morning, I'm going to ask you questions because that's what I do. How many of you have heard your name? Have you heard the Master say, Anna? Deanna, see, it wasn't hard. I can do that. Just think about it. How many of you have been able to do that? You sit down and you, you think, have I heard my name from him? See, he called my name more than once and I ran. How many of you ever hear mom and dad calling you? If my dad stuck his head out the door and said, Tom, it wasn't a big deal. I'd head for the house. 
And he stuck his head out the door and he went, James Thomas Holbrook, this was not going to go well. So the Lord called my name and he called me in a very loving and tender way. The times I didn't answer him, he didn't forsake me. And he continued to call till that one day I realized that I cannot do this on my own because I tried. So this morning, if, if you hear your name, understand who's calling you. I could stand up here with a big list of names and I could, I could say every one of you and it wouldn't mean a thing, I'm just me. But if you hear that name this morning and you know who's calling, you answer the call. Heavenly Father, I'm here. What they were taught to do in the Old Testament, we won't go into that story. What would you have me do? What would you have me do? I'm coming to you, Lord. What would you have me do? So I pray for each and every one of you this morning. I mean that. Every church out here has got a whole lot of folks in it. And people got on their hats and their flowers and everything else. My prayer is that every man of God that stands behind the pulpit this morning lets you know that Jesus Christ the righteous is alive and well. And that he's in the hearts of men and of women. And he'll change your life if you let him. He'll change your life if you let him. A lot of you have beautiful lives, perfect lives. You, you got more money you know what to do with. We all 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds overweight, whatever we are. We got beautiful homes. We got nice cars. We got all of that stuff. But will you make heaven your home? Because if you won't, the rest is going to burn up, folks. It's just temporary. Just the last few years, I've started saying that. I, I collect, I got all kinds of stuff, and, and my boys love my stuff. But guess what? They would give all their, that stuff up to keep me. They would, because they love me. They don't really want my stuff, they want me. But someday I'm going to pass from this life, and when I do, guess what? Everything I have ever done, said, collected, everything else, it'll belong to somebody else. And I'm not going to care because I'm going to make heaven my home. And if you've got a chance to bring me back, leave me alone. Because <laughs> I really believe this. I really believe it. So this morning, let the Lord speak to your heart. Let him speak to your life. Hear his voice and know that it's him. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your beautiful story so often told. Mary's message to us as she would run into our church today would be, he is risen. I have seen him, and I know that he's here. Father, in faith, we believe. And we reach out and we say, he is risen. And I know that he is here. Father, let us hear your voice today. Let us walk before you in everything that we have. And let us wait patiently for your coming, for you are coming back. In your name we do pray. Amen.